Well, Adrian Rogers used to say, for every drop of rain that falls, a Baptist stalls. I hear it's raining outside. I can tell that it's raining outside. Uh, Matthew 5 is an incredible section of scripture uh, that deals with uh, our relationship with other people. Somebody said to uh, dwell above with the saints that we love, oh, that'll be glory. But to live below with the saints that we know, well, that's another story. And it is true, isn't it? I think uh, you would agree with me this morning that getting along with other people is one of the toughest assignments that I think God has ever given to any of us. And we don't find it too difficult to get along with God. But when it comes to having trouble, we have trouble with his creation. Let me ask you a question. How do you react when someone provokes you? How do you respond when somebody irritates you? What do you do when somebody just flat insults you? Do you get angry? Do you seek revenge? Do you uh, want to get even? Maybe even to the point that you might even get filled with hatred. That's a pretty strong word, isn't it? But how do you, how do you respond with people who come at you really to hurt you? Now, Jesus is setting a brand new precedence here in this passage. And he's giving us some brand new definitions of how we are to respond when people are hard to get along with. I want you to stand with me and let's begin reading in chapter number 5, verse number 38. Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> pick it up in verse 38. He says, You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you that you, are, you resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other side also. And if any man will sue you at law and take away your coat, let him have your cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him two miles. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. You, you have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward of you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what are you more than others? Do not even the public and so. But ye therefore, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, I pray now for the freedom and the liberty to be able to preach your word in a way and in a manner that would find a lodging place and somebody's heart and life. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would impart truth to us and enable us, Lord, to be obedient unto you for everything that you have shared with us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. Be seated, please. Now, when Jesus gives us this new definition that's here, you're going to find that it's delineated all the way through these verses that you and I are clearly looking at. Now, let me just say a word. I'm not comfortable with these verses. As a matter of fact, not only this, but there are a lot of passages in Scripture that I find to be very irritable. 
Can, can I get a witness from anybody that's beside me? I, I mean, there's just some certain passages of scriptures that I don't like. And they rub against the grain of who I am. And the fact of the matter is they will continue to be irritable until I get to the point in my life that I finally say, okay, God, I'll do it. And then my life gets conformed to what scriptures are teaching that my life ought to look like. But honestly, this is a little uncomfortable. It's a little bit irritable. In verse number 38, it's really the only place that is uh, where he says, um, you have heard. He could have also said it is written. He, he could have done either one. He could have put, uh, you, you have read this or you have heard it and still be as accurate. Now, in other spots, that's not true. This is the only place uh, that it really is uh, true that what they were hearing is basically what was written in the word. You, you, in verse 38, he says, you've heard that it's been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Well, that's true. If you go look at Exodus 21, 22, and 24, you're going to find that uh, that's exactly what God instituted uh, in the law that is there. I wondered uh, in reading this uh, in Exodus, uh, I wondered if we actually put that into practice. I wonder what kind of an effect it would have on our penal system today. Uh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, uh, an arm for an arm, a foot for a foot, a life for a life. If we just put it into practice, what would happen to our prison system? Um, the ACLU would never allow that to be happening. Uh, they would never permit such a thing and let that take place. Deuteronomy also in chapter 19 and verse 21 also tells us about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a limb for a limb and a life for a life. It is an injunction that God has given to us uh, in the law, the law of tit for tat. Now these Old Testament laws were laid down for a specific reason. Um, and the reason being that victims uh, could get to the place that they also had rights and they also had a say-so in the matter. A lot, lot more than we're seeing today. We are actually seeing a bit much of an unbalance in our society and in our culture where the perpetrators actually have more rights than do the victims. Uh, so the law was given to ensure that victims' rights uh, were observed and carried out. But it was also given that the perpetrators' rights would not necessarily be abused either, that the victims would somehow uh, exact punishment that did not fit the crime, exact punishment that was way over and above actually what was done by uh, the perpetrator themselves. Now, the law never gave the individual right to take punishment. What the law did was channel that to a righteous judge and a godly court system to determine uh, now, if, if you study anything about Judaism, you'll also discover that very rarely was that ever carried out literally. Uh, if somebody lost an eye, very rarely was somebody's eye plucked out that caused it, or somebody's hand cut off, or somebody's tooth were yanked out. Very rarely. The court system would come back and they would uh, assign some kind of monetary payment uh, for the injustice that had occur. Now, Jesus comes along and he gives his teaching here in chapter number five for two reasons. One is that uh, he was criticizing the Pharisees and the Judaizers uh, for taking these things into their own hands rather than depending on the court system to handle it. He was also giving this 
passage and these instructions. Secondly, because they at that time were twisting the Old Testament laws to justify their own revenge. So Jesus comes along and he's teaching us how that you and I are to respond to the injustices that may occur uh, in our life. Now let's pick it up. First, the thing that I want you to see with me is there is a surprising response. A surprising response. Notice in verse 38 again. You have heard that it's been said, an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. Now he doesn't say don't resist evil. He, he's not saying for us to condone evil or somehow come to the place that we're calling evil good. He is saying to us in this passage, do not resist the evil person. He, he, he is saying, don't resist that person who really is doing some things to you uh, that are antagonizing, if you will. He says at that very moment that the person uh, comes against you, is the very moment that that person actually becomes a project in your life. Now, he's saying to that, to us, don't shut them out of your life, but see it as a God-given opportunity on the behalf of God to make a difference in that person's life. Now, we're not accustomed to that teaching. We're not accustomed to living like that either, are we? We're not accustomed when somebody does us wrong to look and think, hmm, now God, you allowed that to happen to me for a particular reason and evidently you want to live your life through me so that that person can be convicted of their sin and see that you have made a difference in my life and you can make a difference in them and bring them to a place where they're pleased. No, no. We don't see it like that hardly uh, ever. The, the New English Version t says, the man who wrongs you. In other words, don't retaliate. Don't seek after revenge. You must not think in terms like that. Even if you are wired up or geared up or made up, to act like that. We're not to think like that. I heard about an old boy and his wife had just gotten married and they were on their honeymoon. And uh, one of the things they were doing on their honeymoon is that they went out and got them one of these horse and buggies and were riding on the horse and buggy and uh, they got a few blocks from where they first got on and the old horse just bolted and rose up. Finally, the groom, he got everything under control and he looks at old horse and he said, that's one. Two or three blocks later, the old, the old horse bowed up and bolted again. Got him under control and he said, that's two. Thought everything was going to be all right, but in a few minutes, the old horse did it for the third time. Bolted up and raised up and started acting up. And the groom said, that's three and pulled out a 38 pistol and just shot the horse dead right there in the street. His new wife looks at him, says, honey, what in the world are you doing? You know you ought not to kill that horse. He looks back at her and said, that's one. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's one guy every mother wishes her daughter would marry, huh? Jesus is simply saying to us, retaliation is not the answer. Again in verse 39. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now let's think through this just a bit. How many right hand, most people are right handed, aren't they? Most people? Do like, are y'all awake out there? Yeah, really? Most people are right handed, aren't they? How many of you are in here that, how many of you are right-handed? Hold your hand up, get the high, right-handed. Right how many of you are left-handed? 
what happened to y'all? <laughs> some kind of genetic disorder of some sorts, I guess, in this thing. Uh, but anyway, most people are right-handed. Now, what does the scripture say? If a person strikes you on the right cheek, now, raise your hand up and, and just do like that. Now, if you're going to slap somebody, where is the natural landing spot for that slap? Not on the right cheek, but on their left cheek. But the Bible says if you strike a person, now, how does that happen? Now, you could do it, but it would be very difficult to do. So what he's talking about here is if anybody backhands you, now, in this culture, in Mideastern times, in biblical days, the most despicable, uh, the most insulting, and the most offensive thing that you could ever do to anybody would be to backhand them. Oh, you just didn't do that. Jesus said, if somebody comes along and they backhand you, Turn to them the other cheek and let them hit you again. Strong words that are in here. Um, I, I read just recently uh, about a black athlete by the name of Tom Skinner. Um, or oh, He died when he was 52 years old. But Tom Skinner grew up in Manhattan, New York. Uh, and, and it was gang infested. When he was 11 years old, he was just scared to death. Wound up having to join one of those gangs just to survive. But when he was 19 years old, God gloriously saved his soul. Changed his life. He was a tremendous football player. Actually got drafted into the NFL and played professional football. Played on the defense. And um, in one of his first games... He tackled the running back in the backfield for a loss. That running back got up so mad, so angry, cursed Tom Skinner and called him the most offensive name that he could have called him. Tom Skinner bent over, picked up the running back, brushed him off, and he says, God loves you, and I do too. Tom Skinner went on to become a tremendous influence and powerful speaker. Had his own ministry in New York and impacted thousands of young kids in Manhattan. Powerful voice for good. But, but, but you, you understand, that's not the natural way to respond. Can, can anybody agree with me here? You, you don't naturally respond in that fashion. And the only reason that Tom Skinner or any of us would be able to respond in that fashion is because of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in us that enables that to take place. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 21 is a major description of the tremendous way that people treated the Lord Jesus. How they the Bible says they hurled their slander and hurled their insults at him. And the Bible goes on in 1 Peter and he says, but he opened not his mouth. He didn't respond. He didn't retaliate. He didn't get revenge. He did not exact any kind of payment back from, that, from those people who were hurling those uh, insults. May I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, the only way that you and I will ever be able to carry out what the scripture is encouraging and commanding us to is that we have to allow Jesus in us to do for us what we cannot naturally do for ourselves. Let me give you the second one, if you will. We have to love each other by forgetting our rights. By forgetting our rights. Now this is the part that I don't like. Uh, this is the part that's really irritable. 
This is the part that just rubs against the grain of everything that I am. Look at verse 40. And if any man uh, will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Now this, folks, listen. You you just kind of read through some of this stuff and you don't really dig down into it to find out what it means. This is a revolutionary idea. This is revolutionary thinking. And and, and in order to understand it completely, you got to understand the importance of the cloak in Jesus' day. Now, the, the, the Jewish man would have an inner clothing that would call, be called a tunic. That's the, the word that he's using here in this passage. And this inner, inner garment would be like our T-shirt or maybe our inner shirt that we might be wearing. And the Bible says if, if anybody wants your underwear, if they want your, your shirt, then you're to give them your outer garment as well. Now, the outer garment was the most important garment that any Jewish male could wear at that time. If you go to Exodus chapter 22 and verses 26 and 27, there's a major command that describes the importance of this outer garment. And it simply says, if somebody borrows your outer garment, or if you borrow somebody's outer garment, uh, you have to, you must. It is a command. You make sure before the sun goes down that you get them back their outer garment. Why? Because the outer garment for that Jewish male was a protective device. It protected against the heat of the sun. It protected against the wind and the rain. It protected against the cold at night. The most important garment that any Jewish man would have. And the Bible says if somebody comes along and they want your shirt, then give them the most important garment that you have in your life. Now, what does that cause us to do? It causes us to forfeit our rights. That's difficult to do. That's hard to do. Now watch this. Watch this in the passage. And whoso, and go back. And if any man in verse 40 will sue you and take away your coat, let him have your cloak also. Now, we all know about lawsuits. Uh, maybe many of you have had to go to court and had the court to decide a case for you and maybe you lost. Let, let, let's suppose for just a minute that the judge says that and, and, and really rules in favor of the person who is suing you and then you are commanded by the court to give them $10,000. What the scripture is saying here at this point is Not only do I want you to give them the $10,000 that the court says that you owe, I want you to give them $10,020 or $10,050. I want you to go beyond what is required of you. You say, hang on a minute, preacher. That's the dumbest thing that I've ever heard in my life. Well, I don't feel like that I owed the $10,000 and I I, I just am not going to give you any more. I'll give the $10,000 only because I'm going to go to jail if I don't. So I'm going to give them, but don't ask of me to give them more than what I'm supposed to give. But Jesus said, (laughs) go beyond that. Why? Why should I do that when I don't even feel that that, that I owe what I am told to give to begin with? Because when they ask you, why are you giving me $10,050? Well, why are you doing that? You only owe $10,000. Well, what's this $50 for? And you respond back to them, because the faith that I live in tells me this is how I live. And then they go back and say, tell me more about your faith. Tell me more about why you believe like you believe. You see, we're to be salt and light. We're to make a difference in this world. Because this is what our faith teaches us. Now, the third thing is that by expanding the requirements. By expanding the requirements. Watch this in verse 41. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him 
twain go with him two miles. Now listen, Israel was occupied uh, by Romans. It was the Roman occupation. And, and let's just think through this for just a minute. A, a Roman was to come up to a Jewish person and say to the Jewish person, you know what? The mailman was sick and didn't run today and this has got to go out and I want you to take this letter and I want you to take it to the post office and I want you to make sure that it gets sent out today. Now, according to the law, that Jewish person has to do that. Regardless of what they had planned out, regardless of what was on the agenda, no matter what the calendar looked like, or how important of a task that they were already involved in, they had to go do what the Roman told them to do. And the Lord says, if he wants you to go a mile, go two miles. He is saying, don't always be about and thinking about your own personal liberty. Boy, have we ever gotten into that today. We've gotten into so much of this rights stuff. We, we hear all about gay rights. We hear all about women's rights. We, we hear today all about uh, human rights. Jesus says, this is a time that you defer your rights. And, and then watch this with me uh, in verse uh, 42. Give to them that give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Now that's a powerful statement. Now let me let me help explain scripture with scripture. So turn over in your Bibles, if you will, to 1 John, and I want you to see chapter 3 with me. 1 John chapter number 3, and notice verse 17. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 17. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. In other words, <laughs> quit talking about it and do something about it. One of the great ministries I think that we have going on right now uh, at First Baptist is our backpack ministry. It, it, do you know that uh, this weekend, 740 kids in our educational system in this county will have food to eat in their home that they normally would not have to eat. The last meal they would have would be on Friday when they were at school and the next one they would have would be on Monday when they got back to school. But because of your generosity in this backpack ministry, 740 families are gonna have enough to eat over the weekend before they get back to school. That's what the Bible is talking about in putting your feet into motion to meet the needs that you say that you care about. It's love in action. It's intentional care. We're going to be looking at the county in a little different lens in these next two or three weeks, riding all over the county and just looking, uh, not at uh, how wonderful things are, but we're going to be looking, God, how can you use this church? How can you use our ministry to make a difference in the needs of the lives of these people that are out here? That, that's 1 John chapter 3. That's Matthew chapter number 5. Don't just say you care. Don't just say you love. Show it according to the word of God. Number four, and here's what you've been waiting on. This is the one you've been looking for. An unexpected relationship. An unexpected relationship. Look at verse 43. You have heard that it hath been said... Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Again, he begins that little section by saying, saying, you have heard. He didn't say it is written because it's not written. They left out something. They left out that section of 
love your neighbor as yourself. At nowhere, do you think that God would ever say to hate your enemies? Absolutely not. At no place will you ever find God saying to hate our enemies. As a matter of fact, he says just the opposite. In Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 21, that you and I, when we have enemies that are out there, if they are hungry, we're to feed them. If they need water, we're to give them drink. In Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 17, there is that clear command that we are to love our enemies. You say, well, preacher, I just don't have that in me. Why in the world would Jesus ask me to love someone that has assassinated my character and shred my reputation with a bunch of lies and called into question uh, who that I really am. You mean to tell me that God really wants me to love that person? Well, watch verse 46. Well, go back to verse 45. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, sending rain on the just and the unjust. For... If you love them which love you, what reward have you? Don't the tax collectors do the same thing? And if you salute your brethren only, why do you more than others? Don't the tax collectors do the same thing? You see, if we live our life on that kind of level, how in the world can they ever know that we have Jesus in our life and that we're different? If we don't live differently, how are they going to know Jesus makes a difference? When I uh, preach from a New Testament passage, particularly the Gospels, uh, Ivor Powell is uh, one of my favorite commentaries. And I went, when I, when I realized God was leading me to Matthew chapter 5, first thing I did was pulled up Ivor's, Ivor Powell's commentary on Matthew. Normally, he'll have an awful lot of information that's in there, but this time, he only had an illustration. And I want you to listen to the illustration that he gave. Quote, Sometimes a good illustration supplies more illumination than an hour of theological exposition. The following account explains what is implied in that statement that we just read a minute ago. Some years ago, I was a guest speaker at a Russian church where the congregation was rejoicing over a letter which had just been smuggled out of Russia. It told a grim but wonderful story. A number of Christians had been severely beaten by the commandant of a prison. One day they were huddled together in their dirty cell when the door opened. The prisoners were amazed when officials threw the commandant in among them. He too had been beaten unmercifully. The Christians hastened to attend to the man's wounds and after a while he was able to give his testimony. He told how he had been seated in his office when a gentle tap on his door announced a visitor. He arose opened the door and saw a boy of 11 years standing with a single rose grasped in his hand. The boy was invited to enter and as he stood by the commandant's desk, said, Air Commandant, it is my mother's birthday and I always gave her a rose on her birthday, but today I would like to give it to you. The communist official thanked the lad and then asked, Son, why do you bring it to me? If this is your mother's birthday, why don't you give her the rose? The boy replied, sir, I cannot because you killed her and you also killed my father. They were Christians, but when she was alive, she always taught me to love my enemies. Air Commandant, I would like you to give this rose to your wife as a gift from me. Commandant was overwhelmed by the sincerity and simplicity of an 11-year-old boy. He surrounded himself and surrendered himself to Christ. But 
when his superior officers discovered what had taken place, they beat him unmercifully and threw him into the prison. That young Russian boy was the living example of what Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Old preacher was preaching on this passage one day and he got down there to that verse 48 and he said, I'm not perfect, you're not perfect. Anybody in here think you're perfect? Anybody in here perfect? When old boy raised his hand and the pastor said, so you think you're perfect, do you? He said, no sir, but I know someone who is. Preacher said, who is that? He said, my wife's first husband. Now, the word perfect here does not mean what you think it means. It actually means complete. Complete. Powerful word. An amazing word. On April the 12th, 1970, I bowed at the foot of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, repented of my sins. That day, An ocean of the blood of Jesus swept over my life and washed me and purged me and cleansed me and made me positionally perfect in the eyes of God the Father. Practically, I mess up every day. Positionally, I am perfect. Positionally, I am complete. Practically, I am moving toward my position. Every day I want to be closer to my position than I was the day before. I don't deserve it. None of us do. But I'm grateful to God that when God saved my soul, he forgave me of all my sin and says, I will never hold it against you ever again. Now I'm trying to make my practice conform to my position. Let me ask you a question this morning before we close. Have you been hurt? Have you been offended? Has someone attacked you? Been rude? ungracious, unkind? Has someone disappointed you by maybe some of the things that they have said about you and done to you? All of us have, haven't we? None of us escape that. Well, what'd you do with it? What are you doing with it? You angry? You want to get even? You want to retaliate? Or maybe you've done what most people do. We, 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 us mountain people are probably as bad about this as anybody. You do us that way and we'll just shut you out of our life. We'll just shut you out. God says, don't resist the evil person. Don't shut them out of your life. Look at it as a project. Look at that person as an opportunity to extend to them how Jesus would have responded, how he would have acted, and let them be the recipients of the grace of God. We're to love them. 
We're to go the extra mile. We're to show intentional 